This is Eugene Chan, and welcome to Straight Talk. Our guest tonight is Mr. Eric Ma, the former Secretary for Development. Mr. Ma is an engineer by profession, and prior to joining the government, he had 25 years of experience in the construction industry, leading teams that planned and implemented major development projects in Hong Kong. He also went on to lead new initiatives in boosting Hong Kong's land supply during his tenure. So tonight, we have invited Mr. Ma to tell us if he thinks the housing shortage in Hong Kong will ever be resolved. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Julian. Eric, you know, the chief executive election is just around the corner and housing issue is most probably the number one concern. Um, actually, since the handover, this has been on the agenda and all the past four chief executives have put in policy to look in this important area. Uh, but Hong Kong today still has the world's most least affordable housing. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, we have topped the global list of the most expensive housing, private housing market for 11 consecutive years. So Eric, with, with your background, maybe you can mm. tell the viewers, what can you give us a, a snapshot of what is happening to the private and public housing sector right at this moment in okay. Hong Kong? Uh, certainly, I think everyone is aware about the housing situation, the acute shortage. So, let's, uh, as there's no uh, low measures, agreeable measures on how to, how to measure it, but let us look at the Hong Kong situation, look at the public housing sector, look at the queue. There's over 150,000 applicants in the queue. And last year, at the end of last year, the waiting time, average waiting time is talking about six years. That's more than double what we pledge uh, for three years, uh, get the uh, housing allocation. So that's the situation on pu public rental housing. Looking back to the private housing sector, the private housing sector, as we mentioned in the international survey, we have been uh, ranked as the least affordable housing city in the world for 11, uh, 11 years consecutively. And in terms of affordability, average household, need to spend 25 years of their average household income in order to acquire a unit for themselves. So 25 years, we are not talking about uh, any interest rate, their monthly expenditure to keep their household, their well-being. So you can see it's a very, very heavy burden for most of the uh, private residential uh, owners. Mm. Right, I've done some research slightly different to yours, 25 years, depends on the size of a flat you're going to buy. Um, if you're getting a 60 square meter flat for US $1.24 million, it's going to take like 60% of the average uh, household for income for 20 years. I mean, it's just as bad. Yes. But anyway, having, having said that, I mean, Hong Kong's housing being expensive has always been the case for the last yes. uh, many, 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 many years. And, but still people still come to work here and live here. So is it inevitable that big cities like Hong Kong, even London or Tokyo or Sydney in Australia, they're always expensive? Mm. So, I mean, what is your view on that? Uh, always. I think the cities have their attraction in terms of uh, working opportunities, in terms of education. So that's why a lot of people rush into cities. However, Hong Kong is very, very unique, is that we are a city with a boundary. We have our city boundary and all our activities from the time we we born we born in hong kong we need to born in hong kong we study in hong kong we educate in hong kong and uh, we continuous our work and uh, entertainment our marriage mm -hmm. etc and uh, even up to the end of our life we die and we need to bury in hong kong so all these activities need to take place within the boundary of the cities so that's the rare uniqueness of Hong Kong, under the one country, two cities. So compared to other cities where they may be coming from the country? Exactly. Like, like, like London, they could live in like two hours, but take the train to work. Yeah. But when they finish work, they don't have to go to the city anymore. Yes. And a, a lot of activities can take place outside the city boundary. So like their education, a lot of kids are bring up in the, uh, in the countryside, and they go to study in a university town. That may not be the major, major city like New York or uh, San Francisco. So these are the difference in Hong Kong compared with other major cities. Mm -hmm. We have all this constraint and our land masses had to cater for all these activities mm -hmm. from the uh, hospital, uh, living residence, shopping malls, office, commercial center, industrial blocks, and even up to the end, the burial ground, 
the Corribarium. We need to provide all within our so, own market. So Hong Kong being a, not a very big city <coughs> with ever increasing population, housing shortage is inevitable in a way. Yes. Right. Um, Mr. Frank Chen was here six months ago, our, mm. our secretary, and we were saying that we were looking at we need 300,000 units like for until the year 2025. Mm. But at the moment, we can only plan 180. So we are short of 120,000 flats for both the public and uh, private housing. Mm. And he said that at that stage, it will be another 10 to 20 years before the current waiting time for the moment you mentioned, 5.8 years for the public housing to reduce to three years. I mean, it's a very alarming figure. Yeah. Do you agree? Uh, that's the hard facts. We can't deny about it. That's right. the plan we have in hand. So if the government want to do something, I think they need to do some quick fix, some quick wins. So I think the forthcoming uh, term of government, they need to think about whether they can have some quick fix, utilization of some of the uh, available resources, uh, like some of the land holding in the private sector or even the farmland in, uh, in new territories. And uh, all these are the process they need to do something. Right, Eric, since you asked, said the government need a quick fix, I'm going to ask you a quick question and quick answer. The title of the show tonight is, will Hong Kong's uh, housing shortage issue ever be resolved? A quick answer. I think housing is a problem all the time. In all the cities, they face a challenge. How to alleviate it, I think is important. Uh, in the past, you may recall in the 1970s, in the last century, we have, a, we have a, a very high natural growth rate. And at the same time, we got influx of migrants. Mm. The problem we face at that time is much, much bigger than now. You remember, after the effort over that three decades, they have built nine new towns, accommodate three and a half million people. Mm. So that's a huge task comparing with currently we face. So I have confidence if we make changes and if we have the determination, I think the situation could be alleviated. Right. Before we move on some projects the government has proposed and from this government, now let me ask you, that I think the major, one of the, the factors that everybody agrees is that land supply mm. is the crux of the matter, right? Yeah. Um, but if you have also done some data work background before I see you today, that 42% um, of our land is used for um, country park, where 25% used for other businesses or development, only 7% is used for housing. I mean, this yeah. is alarmingly low compared to, when you listen, 7%, not 70%, 7% is very low. So that hasn't changed for 15 years. Should this be changed? Uh, what you said is, is the hard facts. And uh, we are very generous in terms of uh, land allocation for conservation for country park, woodland and wetland, etc. as you mentioned. And uh, indeed, total number allocated for all these uses uh, of conservation purpose is 66% out of our 1,100 kilometers square. We are not a big city, but we allocate quite a lot of land for this purpose. We, the remaining is only 24% for all purpose. And out of this 24%, only 7% mm. are for residential users. So that means there are room for us if we want to do something to increase this 7% by another 2 or 3%. Percent mm -hmm. is possible, right? But Eric, only uh, is the yeah. time. Yeah, be it you were in the uh, development bureau. One of your job is to look for new land, as we just said. That, that be, without land, we can't build housing on. And I, I have to refer to the guests who have been to the show. Mr. Mr. Kenneth Lam, the, the president of the Hong Kong Golf Association, was here eight months ago, and he was saying that one of the initiative, one of the the plan is to take away some of the golf course part of the golf courses with the, with the, with the Hong Kong Golf Club. Um, and to him, he said, they need land for sports development. So if we follow in that direction, would it one day, are we going to take back the race course? Maybe we take back the football fields and all those parks that we have. Is it, is it the direction we are going down? It's quite worrying. I think if, uh, for a city, we need to have a balanced development. The people need to live. They are not just for living, they need to have jobs mm -hmm. and they need to have entertainment. So that's why quality need to improve alongside with the housing accommodation being improved. So if from what I anticipate, we need to have a balance. We are not just for job, for working. We need a place for us to live and entertain and enjoy. 
Right. So before we go to a break, I want to ask you about the new projects. I mean, the, this government has come up with the Northern Metropolis, the Tomorrowland Vision, all our great plans for the next 20 to 30 years. Are we on the right track? Do we need them? That's a simple answer. <clears throat> Without them, we have no room to bargain and we have no room to improve. Right. So that's what I think. We need them. So we need them, yeah. even in the 20, 30 years. But how about short-term measures? I'm sure the viewers are going to say, right, you have said the hard facts. Uh, we're going to start with all the shortages. But what are we going to do now? I mean, we still have to live. Yeah. Uh, I think a very simple answer to the acute shortage on the land. First, land is not something you can readily draw out from, the, uh, from a farmland and convert into a housing site or for other uses. It's not. It's a very lengthy process. We need to pass through all the study. We need to make through all the statutory procedures and we need to provide the infrastructure to support it. Mm -hmm. We need to form the site. We need to resume the land from the site and provide all the infrastructure like roads, sewage, drainage, utility, etc. So it's a very lengthy process. So <clears throat> we need to have a, a time frame. We need to look at the problem in two dimensions. One is the time, another is the impact. So if we want to have some quick wins, we need to do something that convert the land from non developable land into developable land within a short time frame. Right. Like the government is now currently proposing like the uh, second round of rezoning exercise. They are going to convert 300 hectares of land for various uses. I think that's one way that, have a, that can have a quicker, uh, quicker delivery time right. because most of this land are within the developed area with uh, all the infrastructure available and they are small in scale. So even though there are a lot of pieces, but they are small in scale and can be absorbed by the existing infrastructure. And uh, the delivery can, within three or four years, mm -hmm. that can help us to alleviate the problem. Okay. Like the big projects, the uh, Land Out Tomorrow, the North uh, Metropolis. Okay. These are huge projects okay. that list at least a decade. OK, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. We have been talking with Mr. Eric Ma about the housing shortage in Hong Kong. So Eric, in the first part, we had a look at the, the snapshot of, of Hong Kong's shortage issue. We, took of, we agree that land supply is the most important factor that we must, we must get to. And we talk about the, um, the future projects the government that has, and you agree it's going to be a right direction. And, but the hard fact is we have problems with the short term. Maybe you can just revisit that topic very, very uh, quickly again. How can we have an interim uh, measures that will alleviate at least some of the problems while we're getting to the, the end of the tunnel with, with the with end result with enough uh, supply. Yeah, uh, some of the measures, <clears throat> like what I mentioned earlier, like rezoning is the quickest way because we identify some uh, land parcel, vacant land parcel that are in the fringe of the uh, developed area. So we can just convert it into certain uses like residential that can be give us a quick supply of land. That has been done before. Certainly some people, will, local people will, will be complaining about the transportation and other measures, but that's the way and that's the price we need to pay for. Mm -hmm. If we want to have a long-term solution, we need to have big ticket items like the land out tomorrow, mm -hmm. like the Northern Metropolis. These are big items and they can give us a long relief. However, they need a long time to, to be to become materialized, maybe 10 years for the whole process. But that will be the long-term solution. So we need the combination of short-term and long-term in order to sustain right. our continuous development over the years. You, know, um, you had your past experience in doing uh, new town planning. You mentioned earlier in the first part that uh, um, that's a good way to do it. You were involved in Sha Tin Tin Shui Wai. Um, what else can the current government do in along that line? Do we have more land for more cities to be built? I think, we, I think for new town, why we call it new town? Because their impact is huge. Like the uh, Tin Sui Wai new town, they're talking about accommodating 330,000 people. While the, the new development areas, we are talking about like Hong Sui Kiu, they're talking about 10,000, 100,000. <coughs> so it's much smaller in terms of scale. For those projects in the, in the 80s, you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s in last century, we have delivered eight new towns to Hong Kong and accommodated three and a half million people. And this new town was, at that time, under very efficient delivery mechanism. 
all the departments, all the resources required to deliver all this uh, infrastructure planning were under one authority, the new territory development branch at that time. So it's very efficient. They are very swift uh, in uh, making decisions, quick responses to the need of the community, <clears throat> and they have the long foresight. So like take the Tisra as example. The government acquired the land from the private sector in 1982, and the first <clears throat> occupation of the private development in uh, Tin Sui Wai was 91. Mm -hmm. And all the 58 private uh, residential towers were delivered within seven years. Mm -hmm. So that's the time frame. Mm -hmm. It's much more efficient than now. Right, Eric, you, have, you, you were in the government for um, a, a, a full time of government, then you were in the private sector. So you will have a first hand experience of from the outside, go to government, know exactly what's happening, back to the private sector. When you look back, if, you, if the new chief executive, Mr. Lee, is going to ask you with your experience, is there anything that we can do better? Because I'm sure um, um, there have been also talks in this community that are saying there are a lot of red tapes, yeah. or even the procedures is, is, is very, very long uh, and tedious. Um, what would you suggest to the new government? Uh, I think for the government itself, we need to aware one thing. You know, government is the, uh, the authority to redistribute the wealth of the, uh, of the uh, city. Mm -hmm. So it has a very important mechanism is check and balance. So all its decision actions need to have a check and balance. And that's why inher they inherited a lot of uh, red tape, in, as we mentioned. That's good and bad. Good is they have the check and balance, but the bad is the delivery efficiency. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I think the most frustrating factor is about the mentality. Right. So before we go on to that, so you're not saying that the red tapes are the major slowing down reason? I think red tape, as indeed in the, in the, in the past, we use the term bureaucracy. Right. The bureaucracy is referring to the government anyway. Right. So it's part of the character inherited from, uh, from all this government structure. Right. I'll give you an example. Recently with the makeshift hospital, mm. we can build something in seven days, just like the mainland. So yeah. it can be done. So you just mentioned about the mentality. Exactly. So that's why I, I said mentality. If we, we get the mentality and we get the determination, we can do it. Why I say it's the mentality? Because <clears throat> uh, we need to be fair to the civil servant. A lot of civil servants, they join the government, they want to do something. But the problem is there's a culture in our community. We have a brain culture developed over the last few decades. You can quote all these examples. Even a cit uh, citizen will complain about a rubbish on the, on the street, a fall in, in a slippery floor. So a lot of brain culture. So they bring all the mistakes or they bring the incident or even they bring a decision by the government. So that push all the civil servants to develop a culture to protect themselves. And that's what you mentioned about this uh, bureaucracy. Mm. It's protect themselves and, uh, and at the time. So in a way, it's understandable. This is it's what understandable. happened. So, so we how need can to change. the government change it? I mean, this, is, this won't change. People will still complain, they yeah. still blame people. So what, what can they do? I think we need to have a, uh, let the civil servants first need to empower them. They have the discretion to make the decision. Right. But at the moment, we, we get, get rid of this by replacing with all these communi uh, committees. Right. You know, it's a committee governing the, the system now. So we need to get rid of those committees and let the civil servant empower to make the decision. Well, since you and mentioned that uh, Hong Kong Foundation report recently said that mm. uh, they can, I mean, they said a pessimistic work culture which slow down the process. Exactly. And so what, they, what they're saying is suggesting a, a system of bonuses and promotions like Singapore and, and, and South Korea. Is that the right direction? I, I would not go that extreme, but I would say most important, get their KPI. They need to have service patch. And uh, like the acute supply of uh, housing and land, uh, and land, they can have a certain target. Right, just a wild, wild guess. If we remove so-called red tapes, make it more efficient, I'm not saying don't use them, Will we be able to catch up the, the 120,000 that was short in terms of both public and private housing within 2025? Is it possible? Uh, 2025 is only three years away. Right. So it's almost a mission impossible. But if you are talking about a 10 year time frame, I think they can do a lot more. Mm -hmm. And in particular, from my perspective, from both in the private sector and the public sector, I think the public sector, they have uh, the role should be retained to regulatory and right. give more 
uh, utilize more on the resources from the private sector. Right. Before we move on to that, there's yeah. always another thing that we have mentioned mm. that I've heard stories about repeated consultations or even what we call duplicate regulations. Yeah. That is slowing down the process. <coughs> Which one should be handled first? Uh, I think we need to handle all, all the front at the same time. The same like the time. consultation, it has been a very demanding job. I have handled over 100, 100 of the, this uh, consultation mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, most of, more than 50% of those attendees are the same frequent comers. Right. So they repeatedly repeating their, their voice. So I think we need to be focused. So that we can be streamlined, as you said. We need to streamline, when we need to combine, we need to have single, let the professional to do the, the recommendation right. and consult the public on the well, Eric, on the last part of the show, since you mentioned um, involving, let the, let the civil servant do the job and, and let the committees reduce their, their, their time and let's get things going. And you also mentioned the, the private sector. Um, in Hong Kong, we know that we need the private sector yeah. to make things happen as well. But there have been also a blame culture, or so-called people are saying the colluding between the government and the, the business sectors. Is that true? Uh, that's always the blame culture developed over the last two decades. But I'm saying we have the mechanism. As far as we get all this into a public tendering system, let the tendering process be open and transparent. I think that's good enough. And uh, a lot of time we need to rely on the efficiency of the private sector to deliver all these projects. Right. Right, one last point I want to ask you. We, we, every five years, we have a new government. Mm -hmm. And with different chief executive, I'm sure they have different ideas, they have different situations at the time, so they have different policies. But as you said, like to 2022 to 2025 is a very short time. Mm -hmm. So how can we ensure to have a continuation of policies for the many years to come? Most important, set and agree the target with the community. If we set, that's the 10 year target, and agree with the community. That's a consensus. And all our machines, all our government machines, should move towards that target. All right, Eric, that's all the time we have. And many thanks for coming tonight to share your suggestions on how to solve Hong Kong's long-standing housing shortage based on your experience with both the government and the private sector. Stay healthy and have a good week and good night.